Good evening, everybody. I remain Larry Mason, former college professor for eight years and a computer system administrator for 30 years. I still feel very obligated to Michael Shanklin and all those who help him bring you the Voluntary Virtues Network. Without such generosity, you would not be hearing my voice. I enjoy lecturing as much as any professor, but I will have more fun when our live shows draw some guests so listeners can ask questions and correct my errors. However, for the next several weeks we must make do with these pre-recorded lectures. This speech is the 61st in the Invisible Hand series of talks, all of which involve money in one way or another. Invisible Hand is also the name of the novel, which I hope this series of talks will inspire you to read, if you have not already done so. Reading or listening to it will cost you only time, since it is freely available on the Internet in both text and MP3 formats at nopomstuff.info. Or, if you're willing to spend a dollar on Amazon, you can download the whole novel to your Kindle. That's as commercial as I'll get. Tonight's main theme is answers to questions I wish somebody had asked beginning with these. Where did you get this strange idea? What did you base your ideas upon? New innovations are developed from modifying previous innovations. What innovations provided the inspiration for this one? This clump of questions all relate to discovery. We are used to people discovering things. Let a toddler out of your grasp at them all and that child will discover all sorts of things, not all of them desirable. Explorers are a part of our cultural heritage. We come upon something and there it is in all its glory, splendor, squalor, ugliness, or whatever. We hear a joke and we recognize its roots in other humorous stories and sayings. If you are old enough to recall George Burns and Gracie Allen, you will perhaps remember how she always misunderstood things. If there was a wrong way to take something, that was said, she would take it that wrong way. Or you may be familiar with Abbott and Costello's Who's On First comedy routine. Misunderstanding was the root of the humor in that instance as well. It's really difficult to come up with a source of a new joke. Sure, we can find out which writer wrote the joke or which stand-up comic first used the joke in a routine, but in these cases you can easily pick out the joke's probable ancestor jokes. The same thing generally applies to inventions in other areas as well. Look at the huge number of romance novels, or mystery novels, or western novels, or horror novels. They each are at least slightly different from the others, but to say one is really new would be stretching things. How about H.G. Wells and his science fiction stories like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or War of the Worlds? The idea of a submarine powered by atomic energy or interplanetary travel had not been used in literature before he did it, to my limited knowledge. But submarines did exist, and huge guns were known, although nothing like one large enough to send a projectile to another planet. So even Wells was using parts of his culture that people already knew about when he wrote those groundbreaking stories. What we are not accustomed to with respect to discovery is someone creating something really new, something with no cultural antecedents. That is, a new thing which had no similar precursors or which was quite unlike any other thing that had ever previously existed even in the imagination. For such an innovation we have no precedent. There are many who would say that such an innovation is impossible. I have, personally, heard a university professor and expert on innovation make just such an assertion. He refused to consider my evidence to the contrary, of course. Telling an expert he is wrong is wasting your time if your aim is to change his mind. My conjecture is that the only way such an innovation can be created is by accident. You have probably heard of the discovery of penicillin, which was the result of a laboratory accident. If an accident occurs and a person with a prepared mind perceives that accident, it is possible, as in the case of penicillin, for some new knowledge to come of it. This is all very well and good for certain physical accidents like slipping on a banana peel or dropping your buttered bread. But what about intellectual matters? What constitutes an accident in the mind, a mental error? One could have a cell phone with autocorrect put in a word you had not intended which gave a different perspective on the sentence you were composing. But that is hardly an accident of the intellect. We see such errors frequently, even in conversation when someone says the wrong word. 
No, an accident of the intellect would require some misunderstanding, some intellectual blunder, some fundamental misunderstanding. It would appear that such an intellectual accident would require an ignorant fool. And how could an ignorant fool come up with a valid or useful innovation based on such an accident? It has been my experience that even intelligent and well-educated people can and do say some foolish things. So if the accident was in having said something foolish, it is possible for an intelligent person to accomplish that part of the accident. Then, if we assume that such an intelligent person can do two foolish things in sequence, the attempt to make that foolish thing seem less foolish can constitute a second foolish action based on the intelligent person's ignorance. In other words, he doesn't know what he's talking about but plunges ahead anyway. The basic idea behind the non-POM came about in just such a way. I said something foolish in a classroom discussion I was leading. And in trying to recover and seem less foolish, I compounded the problem. That was how my mental error or intellectual accident took place. I fear that it shows me in quite an unfavorable light, being ignorant in making the first foolish statement and then being too cowardly to admit I said something foolish. And finally, saying more foolish things to try to cover my shame. This event would have merely receded into my subconscious, never to again enter my conscious mind, had my ignorance on the issue not remained for a year or so while I toyed with the idea I used to cover my embarrassment. If I had been properly educated in that subject area, had I not been ignorant of certain basic facts, I would never have thought of the cover story at all. I would have been unable, mentally, to get the idea in the first place. After all, how could non-POM, something which is not transferable from one party to another, possibly be a medium of exchange? But I did not realize that money was anything that serves as a medium of exchange, a standard unit of account, and a store of value. Just like everyone else, I thought of money as being a physical object or something which represented a physical object. Of course, in my day, when I was just learning about money and how to spend money, there was currency and checks. The checks represented currency. It was only later that banks began to use computers and digital storage devices to do the accounting for depositors. The debit card had not yet been invented. So when I said in class that it was possible to run an industrial economy without money, I was picturing in my mind simply running an economy without currency, checks, and credit cards. But the statement was stupid because the division of labor required by an industrial economy requires a medium of exchange at the very least. What I did in trying to cover myself in the discussion was to invent, on the fly, what became this seminal idea of non-POM. It was not complete, it was not well thought out, but the basic idea was there. It was all the result of an accident. In the years that followed, I noticed that most of the problems I was seeing on TV news broadcasts would simply not exist with the non-POM. Even problems such as cancer or tornadoes, which were not financial problems, would be much better dealt with than they were with POM or physical object money. It took me a year or two to realize that the physical object nature of POM had all these evil consequences no matter what various laws, customs, or religions required. It took a few more years for me to begin realizing just how pervasive the evils of POM were. The biblical verse about the love of money being the root of all evil while not strictly accurate due to the natural disasters like storms and psychological maladies such as paranoia, did have considerable truth to it, particularly when it pertains to money as a physical object. You will please note that if I had taken it upon myself to solve even one of the most common social problems, say war or poverty or unemployment, I would never have come up with such a complete, comprehensive, and painless solution as the non-POM. Likewise, it would never have occurred to me to change the very nature of the money we use. That would not have seemed possible to me. Yet I have come to realize that it is the very nature of our money that creates and maintains these problems. War, poverty, and unemployment, for example, are all products and consequences of the nature of our money. So the only way we can actually solve problems like organized crime, political oppression, and inflation is to not consider them in isolation, but rather to look at all of them at once and see what these things have in common. 
As if that were not enough, after still more years of pondering, I realized that much of what happens in societies around the world is a consequence of the use of palm. Has it ever occurred to you to wonder why almost every nation in its early days creates something like the pyramids of ancient Egypt? Not that every agricultural society builds pyramids, though many do, but they all seem to create some large, for them, artifacts which serve no physical purpose in improving the lives or protecting the capital goods of their society, despite consuming huge amounts of resources. Just imagine the amount of skilled labor necessary to create the temples, the seven wonders of the ancient world, Stonehenge in England, the huge drawings in Peru called the Nazca Lines, which are only properly viewed from hundreds of feet above them. If the effort and resources that were invested in the development of these things were utilized in other ways, the lives of the people and the security of the economies of those nations, peoples, and societies would have been greatly improved. As far as I know, the anthropologists and archaeologists have no plausible explanation for these irrational actions by agricultural societies. They know that the work was done, but why such dysfunctional behavior was near universal is not explained. Yet the idea of the consequences of POM does indeed explain that irrational behavior. POM provided both the motivation and the means by which such structures were created. POM explains a considerable amount of the apparently irrational behavior in human societies around the world. All governments tend to act in the same ways due to POM. All nations have organized crime due to POM. Agricultural economies oppress women due to POM. Nations have poverty due to POM. War exists perpetually due to POM. The boom and bust cycle in economies exists due to POM. Racial, ethnic, and religious discrimination exists due to POM. Political oppression exists due to POM. Once one understands the consequences of POM, one, one can explain all sorts of uniformities in the nations of the world, features which do not exist in hunting and gathering economies, which have no medium of exchange. If I had attempted to explain any of these insanities and uniformities across the cultures and nations of the world, I would never have realized or considered the influence of the physical object nature of money. I might have noted money in my explanation for some specific uniformity, but I would never have attributed that to the fact that the money was physical objects, or represented physical objects, and was treated as if it were a physical object even when in electronic form. Therefore, the only way these explanations could have come about was by the explanation coming first and then being applied to all those features of nations in tests of the hypotheses. In other words, I came at all these things backward. I had the solution before I realized it could solve problems. I had the explanation before I realized what it could explain. So how did I come up with this idea? I was just incredibly lucky. My intentional, purposive contribution to the solution was minimal. Mostly, it was just to realize that the idea could do so many things. I don't deserve much credit for the idea at all. I think thousands of others could have done as well or better if they had been similarly lucky in being foolish and having the same moral failings that I have. Our next question has to do with how a non-POM system might fail or be impossible. A substantial proportion of the people who have been exposed to this idea have said, before they even understood it, that it was impossible, it would never work, and it would never be adopted. I attribute that proportion to my failings as a salesman, as a person who is good at persuasion, I'm not good at swaying others, or as a showman. But regardless of the number of people who doubt, or the proportion who doubt, the question needs to be asked, how could a non-POM economy fail? We already know many ways that POM economies can fail because we have watched them fail many times over throughout history. We will skip the question of whether it could be adopted because that depends on POM, not on non-POM. Even though adopting non-POM might be the only rational thing for a nation to do, POM produces irrational behavior by individuals and nations all the time. See the archive for previous lectures on war, poverty, unemployment, discrimination, and so forth. Non-POM requires some people whose duty it is to evaluate the benefits and harms which are the consequences of the actions of others. That is, some persons have to decide the amount of earnings of those who produce net benefits. 
there must be some minimum number of such people for any economy. Some proportion of the functional adults in an economy must perform this task. If not enough people have this role, the system will fail. There is a companion requirement that there not be too many persons in this role. There must be some maximum proportion for each economy of such persons. If that number is exceeded, the economy will fail for lack of production. There will not be enough people producing net benefits to keep the economy functioning. So this is one obvious way in which a non-POM economy could collapse. Non-POM requires that there be sufficient basic necessities produced for everyone. If that is not the case, the system fails. So if there is some natural disaster such as a supervolcano eruption or a failure of the power grid due to a solar flare, the system will fail. Of course, this lack of necessities must last for some time before the system will fail, a few months perhaps. But if the condition appears to be permanent, then the non-POM system will not work. This is similar to a famine's effects on order in POM economies. Non-POM requires that there be a significant amount of goods and services designated as luxuries be produced to provide motivation to those who generate net benefits. If the productive resources of the economy are unable, for whatever reason, to provide both necessities for all as well as sufficient luxuries, then there will not be enough potential earnings to keep the system operating. This is similar to a shortage of money in POM economies, as when banks fail and shrink the money supply. See the Great Depression. Non-POM requires a network of computers and software functioning most of the time. Please note that there is no need for the computer services to be operational 100% of the time like the airlines and power grids require. It seems to me that the computer network could be down for a couple of weeks without wrecking the system. People would find that annoying and inconvenient, but it would not bring down the new social order. On the other hand, an economy which does not have at least a simple internet or its equivalent would not be able to adopt non-POM. The records, the accounts of each person who has money, must be maintained and computers are the only way that can be done without human cheating. That is, the computer system can follow its programming instructions without trying to cheat and without being tempted by bribes. Human accountants, keeping the records by pen and paper or stylus and clay tablets, can be tempted to cheat and accept bribes. The amount of information which must be processed and stored for the system to work is simply far beyond the capacity of the human beings in an industrial economy. Now if the economy were simple enough, it might be possible to operate it in a cooperative manner with some type of computerless non-POM. But that economy would have to remain very small and very simple, like that of a commune, a kibbutz, or similar enclave. Non-POM economies tend to change rapidly with improvements which would soon get beyond the capacities of human beings to operate the record system without computers. Non-POM tends to replace any POM which exists in the economy before the transition to non-POM. But let's assume that there is a very large nation right next to a very small nation and the large nation has a POM economy while the very small nation is non-POM. In such a situation, the large nation's POM would still retain considerable value for the citizens of the small nation. In that context, the evils of POM would remain since the citizens of both nations would be willing to accept the POM in trade. Also, those who determine the net benefits produced could easily live a double life in the small and large nations. Thus, a nation that adopts non-POM must be relatively large or isolated. Either way, it would need to be fairly self-sufficient in case neighboring nations refuse to trade goods and services instead of POM in the beginning. To pay fairly, a considerable amount of information concerning the flow of goods and services in the economy will have to be maintained. That is, from the first acquisition of raw materials through the distribution of the finished product, each person who played a role in each of the stages of production and distribution of each good or service must be noted and their role evaluated. This is a large amount of information. Our POM economies already collect and process this information at each stage. But they do not pool such information in a single database. There is no reason, in theory, why such already collected information in a POM could not be pooled and processed by computers in a non-POM economy. But the economy is going to change as all economies do. One must expect that it will become still more complex in its productive processes. 
one must expect that many more factors will be included as influencing the production of net benefits. Providing good nutrition to an expectant mother will improve the chances of her child being more productive as a citizen after birth, for example. Just think of all the factors that come into play for each worker. The result should be a considerable increase in the data to be considered in crediting each worker's account. Can the computer system and its programs scale to the required degree? If not, the system will fail as the economy becomes more complex. I feel I should note at this point that the free market money non -POM, does not require that the payments be accurate nor right in any sense just as any other free market does not set the prices that are in any sense accurate or right. It is sufficient if the payments motivate the appropriate behavior. But to provide that motivation, those who work must believe that their efforts do affect their income. Can a non-POM nation deal with a militaristic POM nation that threatens invasion? If conquered by a POM nation, the non-POM economy would be replaced by a POM economy by force of arms. Is a non-POM economy as capable of defending itself as is a POM nation? In that a non-POM economy is far more efficient than a POM economy and is far quicker to respond to changing circumstances, it should function better at both preventing and winning wars. But the fact remains that a non-POM nation could be conquered by force of arms. Since no one has to work to live in a non-POM economy, the possibility exists that there will be too few people motivated by a desire for luxuries to produce what is needed for the economy to succeed. Of course, no one has to work to live in a POM economy. Prison and the military for men have always been options and for women, working only at home has been the norm for many economies. I also feel compelled to point out that in POM economies there is always a significant percentage of the labor force that is unemployed against their will. Also in POM economies, about 25% of production goes to support the money system itself bookkeepers, accountants, lawyers, bankers, and insurance workers, for example. So the proportion of the functional adults that would be needed to work in a non-POM economy is far less than the proportion in a POM economy. If we add to that the ease of finding work that earns pay to perform in a non-POM economy, we reduce the chances that of this potential source of failure quite a lot. Since no one has to work in a non-POM economy, it is possible that some of the vital but quite unpleasant or dangerous jobs would not be performed by anyone. This could wreck the system as well. But in a non-POM economy, pay for net benefits is controlled by free markets. This means that the pay for unpleasant and dangerous jobs would increase to the point that sufficient people choose to do those jobs. However, this is still a potential economy wrecking aspect especially if the higher pay for those jobs has not had time to increase the supply of workers for those jobs or develop robotic alternatives. It could be that the public, the consumers, demand pleasure from the economy rather than the production of the capital goods needed to prevent or recover from disasters. Since people are notoriously selfish and short-sighted, refusing in many cases to defer gratification for future needs, one can imagine a public so selfish that it will not allow sufficient production of capital goods, demanding consumer goods production instead. This also could destroy the economy, especially in the event of a major natural disaster. Another means by which a non-POM economy might fail would be through some social contagion. You might think of a social contagion as being an extreme fad or craze. We old folks can remember the hula hoop fad which spread rapidly across the U.S. in the late 1950s or thereabouts. That craze was innocuous and actually got many people who would otherwise have just sat staring at the few TV shows that were available in those days to get up and exercise. But not all instances of social contagion are benign. One can imagine some fad which is bad for health or sanity such as is the case with some recreational drugs. But there are also memes and memeplexes which can become extreme as well. If everyone became shakers, a religious group which practiced celibacy, the society could obviously collapse. Similarly, one can imagine an ethical code or even an ethical system which becomes predominant and requires that benefits be defined only in terms of what is good by that code or within that system 
and ignoring actual harm done because that harm was not a result of behavior which violated that code or which was opposed by that system. Those large stone heads on Easter Island were a major reason why the trees on the island were all cut down since those trees were used to move the heads from the quarry to the shore. The ethical system of the people of Easter Island required that the heads be created and put in place despite the harm that action brought about. Devotion to such a system with non-POM could cause the economy to fail. As it happens, Easter Island was a POM economy. One can imagine that there could be a situation in which a society has too much cooperation. Perhaps even cooperation can get out of hand and have bad consequences. Kindness may have evil consequences when carried to extremes. If we are reluctant to kill any living organism, even bacteria, we might so limit our production that we cannot provide basic necessities for all, or we might keep alive such large numbers of people who are unable to be productive that there are not enough productive adults remaining in the workforce. One can picture a science fiction future in which billions of people of extreme age exist in life support tanks, unconscious minds living in bodies kept alive by advanced technology, similar to what occurred in the movie Coma. In other words, it may be that the virtues which non-POM encourages would become vices by virtue of the way they were pursued. I find this difficult to believe, but logical or not, I must admit that such is a possibility. Coordination in POM economies tends to be imposed by force. The command economy in which the head of state issues orders which everyone must obey on pain of imprisonment, death, or torture is an extreme example. But even in so-called free market economies using POM, one tends to work under the threat of losing one's job and take orders from above oneself in the hierarchical bureaucracy. So this is how we are used to coordination being achieved. But there are some instances, such as open source software, in which coordination is achieved and maintained without force or the threat of force. We are all familiar with Wikipedia, which shows considerable coordination without anyone being ordered around. Reassuring as that is, it may be that there are certain kinds of necessary projects which simply require coercive coordination to function at all. Perhaps the present-day projects which employ eminent domain, like the Three Gorges Dam in China, would be impossible with a non-POM economy. How would a large highway project such as the U.S. interstate highway system be built with a non-POM economy? Sure, such a system would produce a lot of benefits to almost every citizen in the nation. But to achieve those long straight stretches with only gentle curves requires a lot of land. What if some landowner in the middle of the site of a cloverleaf refused to allow his land to be used for that purpose? What if he preferred to keep it as a puppy farm where he could raise small yappy dogs? What if he simply did not care about the additional income he could have from the highway? I mean, there must have been scores of thousands of landowners whose land was taken to build the interstate system. Surely some of them did not want to sell their land and had to be forced to cooperate. Could the informal social pressure from friends and neighbors be sufficient to gain compliance in enough cases to allow for all the necessary large projects? And then there's the whole matter of who's in charge on large projects. How is that settled with non-POM? With POM, it's a big money power struggle with the government being the pawn used to settle who gets to be king of the hill for the project. With non-POM, there is no government involvement. And the persons who decide on individuals' earnings only enter the picture after the fact when consequences become obvious. Unless large projects can be successfully carried out and coordinated with other events and projects, the non-POM economy must fail. It is my best guess that the leadership role would be assigned to those with good, a good track record, those who have a reputation for successful completion of such projects in the past. I am confident that I will be able to think of other possibilities for ways and situations in which the non-POM system would fail. POM has provided many examples of ways in which POM economies and the POM ethical system have failed in the past. So we know for sure that POM has a serious destabilizing effect on human economies and nations. The question is, does non-POM give us better odds of success in our efforts to survive as a species?